to follow up Pastor Dr. Ronald Forehan on the doctrine of the church and on the ministry is a very difficult thing to do. Um, one thing can, so many things can be added and so forth, but the ministry and figuring up on this uh, speech that we had uh, in regard to supporting our, our Concordia Theological Seminary, the ministry is really the only occupation that has to repeat itself. And that is, um, I met a contractor here, I don't know what the, your other occupations are, whether you're a public school teacher, whether you're a banker, whether you're a secretary, whether you're a union worker, and that is, in those professions, you do not necessarily have a sense of succession. I know a lot of people. I hang around with a lot of retired people, because I passed the age of retirement some time ago. And some people said, well, you shouldn't have passed it, you should have taken it when you had a chance. <laughs> and that is, um, well, when you hang around with people who are like you, the, the baby boomers, 55 and six, you know, how many of you are baby boomers? How many of you baby, baby boomers are, are self-centered? Just raise your hand. <laughs> One of my colleagues is a baby boomer. And he said, well, we were taught that we had something to offer the world. And I said, just get over it. <laughs> You don't. And uh, I'm surprised how many people look forward to retirement. Uh, they really don't like their jobs. The ministry is an entirely different situation. To use Dr. Feuerhans terms, it's a hobby to us, it's an attitude. You can't, you can't get away from it. A, a lot of men, really, a, a lot of men who are in the ministry and reach that age, who should be retired, well, my father, he died at 68 uh, years of age. He didn't retire. Back in the good old days of dead orthodoxy, pastors didn't retire. Now they're retiring. Some year, there's Herman Otten quotes, uh, uh, quotes an, es uh, an essay that I wrote. The only thing he quotes in a favorable way, he really doesn't like me. He says we're friends. I think he's pushing it. <laughs> but I, I'm kind of interested in statistics, not that I'm given to money or anything like that. And uh, there are very few pastors over the age of, only very few pastors over the age of 60 who aren't retired. Very few men. Now, uh, and um, the reason for that, and I can understand that, because the ministry really doesn't have to do with running churches. One of the things which I dislike about my job, but since I've reached a certain age, I don't do it. I don't advise students anymore. So I don't have to help anybody, and I really love it. I don't have people knocking on the door. I will see people after chapel in the coffee hour, but I don't want someone to come and sit in there for an hour because he has some kind of a problem. But what really gets the minister down is the administration. And, uh, but apart from all, and so when these men are retired, what they do, they're more active than ever. They're preaching every Sunday, they're running all over the place. And the congregations are getting a pretty good deal because they're not paying full freight. Not that the people are cheap, don't get me wrong, but the ministry has a problem. Ministers have a problem because it's, it's a divine obligation. They look upon the, the, role, the, the roles that they have over against God, not over against the congregation. A number of years ago, um, <coughs> I was in Oregon with some rednecks. I knew I was in trouble when they picked me up in the pickup truck. And uh, they engaged in conversation, which a person like me from New York, being, you know, more sophisticated, uh, I couldn't relate to. <laughs> so uh, as we, when we got there, we're, well, the next day, it was being taped like this was, but they was, um, and they, we were speaking about the Office of the Keys, the question which Dr. Feuerhan, who I've known for many, many years, um, asked uh, about uh, to whom did the Office of the Keys belong? Now, Dr. Feuerhan quoted the small catechism, but he didn't tell you that was the part written by Justice Jonas and not Martin Luther. But in the um, Augsburg Confession under Article 28, it says quite specifically that the Office of the Keys does nothing else but the ministry of preaching the word and ministering the sacraments. That's the words. So when I was asked, what was the Office of the Keys? I will never answer that question again. Because the question was, who has the Office of the Keys? I should have said, you do, sir. 
the person who asked that question thinks that he or she has the office of the keys. But I was more naive then than I am now. Now at my age, I don't care. So I answered, Peter, holy smokes. <laughs> Did all hell break loose? They brought me up on, it's in the Bible. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. It says it. I can't help it. It's in the Bible. Well, they brought me up on charges in those days. My political career was on the ascendancy. I was about 48 years of age. I was the academic dean, and I was, you know, well, they brought me up on charges, and they wrote to Preuss, and may his soul rest in peace, and then they wrote to the Board of Regents. And on a Saturday afternoon, they had a tape of this thing. Well, I, I refused. I, Preuss gave me a copy of the tape. I utterly refused to look at it. I cannot stand looking at myself. I never preach an old sermon because the second time, the second time you preach a sermon, if it's on the same day, it's pretty good. The third time when you preach a sermon, you say, yes, get rid of this thing. Because you see, you, uh, you see all the faults that you, you have. And so the Board of Regents looked at it to find out what was my great sin. Well, I looked at this tape and I said, my, you're pretty good looking there. I had a blue, I had a blue blazer on and I was thin and I had hair. This is a pretty good show. Well, thankfully, since it was about three or four in the afternoon on a Saturday, uh, they, they, were, they were soon asleep. <laughs> And, no, and nothing happened. Um, the, the office of the ministry is a burden. It's a burden from which you cannot run away. Everybody who is critical of his or her clergy person should really, should really think about what, I, what, what, what would I do in that job? It's very hard to be a clergy person because every Sunday, depending on the size of your congregation, you have between 50 and maybe a couple, several hundred people who know no more about the subject than you do. Right? And then when we hear in a little while from Dr. Vikentra on the law and the gospel, you know, I, Carl knows that I'm against the phrase, the law and the gospel never converted anybody. When you preach the law, you have to be pretty specific. You have to be specific so the person sitting in the pew says, hey, how did this guy know so much about me? And then the next thing he has to say, since he knows so much about me, maybe we ought to get rid of him. <laughs> maybe we ought to, and if, and if that's hard to take, then why don't you folks buy a copy of the Bible sometime and read the Old Testament? They didn't like what they heard because the prophet or even Jesus was saying something about them. So the office of the ministry, I'm just going to read from this manuscript and then I'm going to comment on this, unless you want to hear other anecdotes. They finally got me, by the way, but they got me on all theology was Christology. Now that's an amazing statement. Even some of the most conservative people in the world don't get it. And that is, if the Bible isn't about Christ, what else is it about? What is it? If it's just the word of God, the absolute word of God, to speak to any situations, and I'll just go down the street to the Baptist church, and I, I don't know anything about where I am. I haven't got a clue what church this is. <coughs> I was really taken when Mr. Ollendorf thanked the members of this church. I thought, this must, wasn't this his church? I've never heard a pastor get up in his own church and thank the church. Kind of self, then I found out it wasn't his church. I hope he, oh, he's a really a great guy. Coming over here this morning, he says, by the way, you're in charge of the church service tomorrow. I'm not going to be here. <laughs> but he's really a very kind man. He didn't tell me last night so I could at least get a night's sleep. <laughs> and, and, isn't that too much? You think he's a, after that fine speech over here, wherever you are, saying what a great guy he was. I'd have to reevaluate that one. Ah, uh, yes. You can go to a Baptist church. I have an idea a lot of conservative Lutherans are just Baptists who believe in maybe baptism. And that's all they are. 
Uh, righteousness, you see, when you see righteousness exalted the nation on your bumper sticker, what that really means, I am a morally pretty good guy, and the next guy isn't. That is so un-Lutheran. Absolutely un-Lutheran. I think there are two places where I think it'd be very hard to be a clergy person. One among the Mormons. Wow, that's a difficult assignment. <coughs> because they believe in another God. Either they're atheists or they're polytheists. Atheists, no God. Polytheists, they're all gods. You choose. God the Father has children. God the Son has children. Hey, you can have a couple of children too. And if that, you know, if you can't get enough children from one wife, get another wife. That's Mormonism. And the other thing is the Southern Baptists. Wowie. Because this one kid, He's not a kid anymore, he's about 50 years of age. That's a kid to me. He always, up in the Poconos, guy became multi, multi-millionaire. When he talks, he talks like this. Dr. Scare, how are you? And fine, so forth. Well, he says he was getting a little tired of the Lutheran church. Well, is that so? Yeah, it's gonna to go to a Baptist church. What a great church, 17,000 members, basketball courts, Starbucks coffee, Food, co food course, and you know the problem is with Lutherans, he hasn't quit yet. He's gonna get re he said he was gonna get rebaptized. I said, I hope you only go down once. <laughs> he, <laughs> he said, you Lutherans put too much stress on sin. See, well, see with that crowd, you really got a problem. I'm not, I hope I'm not stealing Dr. Vikentia's lecture, yeah, but you really got a problem because they don't, they have already made decisions for Christ and that means that they are no longer sinners and hence the law is no longer applicable so life is very, is very happy. The scriptures is all about Christ whether it's about Adam or Isaiah or David or anybody, that's all about Christ. Everything, and the ministry is in the Christ. Now one thing, I do not, we have new hymnals, <coughs> and I'm not going to learn a new hymnal. The new hymnal has seven, five, how many services does it have? It has five services. Five services in the front. Not realizing that even the best of your members are only in church once every four Sundays. So you got to find out what page do I... I go to too many services. In my church, the Episcopal Church, we just have one service. That's it. You might have a woman priest, but what the heck, you can't have everything. And uh, it says, by the authority of Christ, I forgive you all your sins. If you go home to your own church, you can look it up. Back in the old dead orthodox hymnal, it says, in the stead and by the command. Now you're saying something entice. I always learn when I listen rather than what I, than when, than what I read. You know, when you hear something, you say, ha ha, I have to go and look at this thing. And the minister stands in the stead of Christ. In one of the catechisms, in one of the publications put out by the synod, it could be the synodical catechism. I do not, I just use the old dead orthodox one from 1940. I haven't progressed very far in my thought. It has the old Lutheran doctrine that the man stands in the stead of Christ. <coughs> this catechism, I think it says, in the stead of the congregation, which just gets, gets us back to the power of the keys. So it's commonly held by a good segment in the Missouri Synod that all the people have the power of the keys. That's what Dr. Forehan was speaking about. If you didn't know the word, the Eber Tragungslehre, Eber means over, tragung means to, uh, to hand, that the people take their authority with, as the office of the keys and then they funnel it into one person and then that person speaks it back to us. Well, if we all have the power of the keys, then why don't we just say, I forgive myself? This, uh, this is really one of the problems. This is one of the problems that a pastor has. He has to act, he has to enforce discipline. I hate the word discipline. To me, it sounds too Calvinistic because it isn't discipline in the sense of punishment. We're not, you know, with Calvinism, God punishes people. That's a, and that thought is that if something goes wrong in your life, you're being punished. We're all, 
if something goes wrong, remember God has only bad options in this world. He does. He doesn't, he doesn't have good options. He has bad options. And he uses bad options to accomplish good things. So if something goes wrong in our lives, there's an essay in the latest issue of Logia on Dr. Robert Royce's biography, he says, in which they, whoever reviewed it made this comment, in which Dr. Robert Royce mentions um, the beneficial effects, that's the wrong word, of mental illness. That God actually works through this kind of a bad situation in order to, that's what Dr. Robert Royce said. It's, I don't know if they have the latest issue here. And also in regard to the ministry, and to follow up on... That Mr. Finch was speaking about, one of the greatest things about what has happened in the last 10 or 15 years, part of the essay I was going to read to you is the very strong doctrine of the ministry that you have in the Gospel of Matthew. The second discourse is on the apostles. The first discourse is about the Christian community. That's the Sermon on the Mount. The second is, who's in charge? And the answer is, in the apostles. Now, it might sound, in fact, some people have quoted me completely wrong, that only a clergy person can convert somebody. And I think we have some young men going around saying this. One of the things that strikes me about the Gospel of Matthew is to get the great believers in Christ in that gospel are people to whom nobody has gone. Do you know that the wise person show up without an invitation? Do you know that nobody said come and find Jesus? They probably they probably were at, they probably were at attending some local synagogue and they knew something. They could have been Samaritans because they had a prophecy from the book of Numbers about a, a star arising. If they had the rest of the Old Testament, they might have known about Bethlehem. Who knows? And they come of their own and find Christ. Nobody knows how belief is, how belief is accomplished. Nobody knows. How about the Canaanite woman? Nobody went and got her. She heard about it. And in the fourth chapter of Matthew, it says, and the, the rumor of him spread throughout all Judea, Samaria, and so forth. You can get the exact words. People were just talking about it. If people are committed to the church, by heck, they're going to bring, the, they're going to bring their grandchildren to church, <clears throat> even if their parents or their children won't let them go, because Christianity is worth it. And having said all that, how the gospel is spread in the most unusual ways. There's the office of the ministry, which is established in the person of Christ, held by the prophets, held by the apostles, and now held by us. And it's a burden. Now, one of the strange things is, as Mr. Finch pointed out before, the work that we're doing do you know that 10 or 15 years ago, we would have never anticipated what's happening in our seminary now? We did not go and do missionary work in Siberia. These people in Siberia were like the Macedonian man coming to St. Paul. Come over and help us. In the CTQ, of which I am currently the editor, until the associate editor pushes me off the side of the boat, which he is doing very well to do. Um, we are going to publish the sermon of the Bishop of Siberia who was consecrated in Estonia in the cathedral as a bishop. In that sermon, he has his life story of how he was a communist. And the story is a most marvelous story because he was brought up in a good Soviet family. And he and his parents were cynics. It's good to be a cynic. That means you don't take anybody at their word. So they simply laughed at all the Russian stuff. And strangely, the more the authorities said there was no God, the more he entertained the idea that there could have been a, a God 
So like the wise persons in the Christmas story, he goes looking around. And somehow he shows up in Estonia. He tells how he sleeps. He has no money and he sleeps in this drafty. It's on the sermon that he, that was, he preached for his own consecration as bishop of Siberia. He, he, he speaks of how somehow he found a Lutheran and then he found a Lutheran pastor and so forth and on. And that's how he became. We didn't do it. Nobody at our seminary did it. Nobody can take credit for that. Don't ask me how it happened, but it happened. And now, I, was, and I don't have too much to do with foreign students because I don't understand them. I can barely understand some of my foreign-born colleagues. <coughs> I have no idea what they're saying. So I don't. But I was at a um, reception held for them two days ago. We have people there from Korea and every place under them, Sweden, Kenya, Sudan, Nigeria. And we didn't do it. We didn't do it. And so this gets back to the concept of the ministry. And also gets back to you. And to the kind of people I hang around with who are like you. That means people who are in their 60s who have just retired or people like you who are planning your retirement. That's the big thing in your life is your retirement. You want to get one of those homes and drive around the United States and bother your children? There was one pastor in Connecticut, his in-laws, his in-laws come and pa park their vehicle in the church parking lot for about six weeks. Boy, I tell you, that's great. Thank heavens I don't get along with my kids. It's really great. You want to look forward to retirement. We're not looking forward to retirement. And the speech was given in not the most delicate way by Mr. Finch about how Mr. Ollendorf was looking forward to retirement. Maybe, maybe he was in contact with some members of Mr. Ollendorf's congregation before this. I do not know how he knows that much. But it's true. It is absolutely true that every minister asks the question, what's going to happen to the people after I leave? A lot of the young mothers, particularly fathers too, but mothers who may have such a terminal disease as cancer, the one thing which is on their mind is what's going to happen to their children. And so it is with the, the pastors of the church. They have to ask the question, what's going to What's going to happen? I felt that way when I left my last congregation a long time ago in Rockville, Connecticut. I knew something would go sour really soon. The year's 1966. 1976, the church is out of the Synod. Even though the, my predecessor had been the son of the great Francis, the great Francis Pieper, the great dogmatician. Things can turn sour pretty quick, but things can turn around very nicely the other way, too. We would not expect, we are now in fellowship with the Church of Kenya. The Sudan Church might come over to us, at least according to the speech that Mr. Finch gave. And I don't know how many millions of Lutherans there are in Madagascar, where my colleague, John Pless, known as C.J. Pless, Catechism John, I think that's the only thing he can quote, CJ, but he goes over there. I thought he was giving these students free rides. He takes 10 students over to Madagascar for a week to work. When they come back, each of those students has to visit 10 congregations to tell about the work. Now that, con that, that synod, that church in Madagascar, they have a huge number of Lutherans. There are more Lutherans in Madagascar than there are in the Missouri Synod but they get their money from the Lutheran World Federation. And the Lutheran World Federation say, if you don't take a woman priest, we'll just tie the financial noose around your neck a little bit tighter. The man who was dean over there was against the ordination of women. The Lutheran World Federation said, we think you can get another man to run the school for you. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against evil in the very high 
high places. So it's not simply mission, but the ministry has to continue. It's not an option, which then gets us to this unusual introduction. And I will read it. How much time do I have? He doesn't know. Bring back Mr. Ollendorf <coughs> with all his warts. J. E. L. Preuss is reputed to have remarked that ministry issues among Lutherans will have to wait for heaven to be resolved. The late Dr. Robert Preuss's brother called a faculty study meeting on the ministry question with the understanding that discussion would be conducted only on biblical grounds. And by the way, it wasn't. It upset me very, very much because I represented one position and Norbert Mueller, who then became Preuss's successor for several years, he was quoting the confessions and synodical documents. And I wanted to say, foul ball. Tell me ahead of time what the discussion is and we'll all obey by the same, same rules. Don't change horses in midstream. I don't know where that says in the Bible, but I like it. <laughs> now, the other issue that we have, and that is we have a lot of our churches which do not have clergy persons and they have lay persons celebrating communion. Or they have school teachers or deacons or whatever they call them. I received from a deacon once, I'm not going to do it again. And I have Dr. Feuerhahn, the reference for that. Now, if things are bad in our church, your church, the ELCA, you don't have to even read the church newspapers to find out what's happening. And that is that they have the business of what are they going to do with homosexual clergy persons. And the answer is, well, it's against church law, but we're not going to discipline them. Well, that's great. Not too, most of you are too old to have 16 or 18 year old kids. But you can remember that. You say to the kid, here's the car keys, Sonny. You see, it's out there, the speed limit down to, on the road is 55 miles an hour. You go 70. You go 90. So now in the ELCA, you have a policy which is against it, but a policy which isn't enforced. That's, now that brings us to the doctrine of the atonement. Because if we have law, which does not have penalty, then it's no longer law. If it's law that has penalty, then I, how, do I get my, how do I get out of the situation? And of course, that's the doctrine of the, well, you can see what's happening. <coughs> now, some ELCA bishops have got guts. God bless them. <coughs> they say they're going to enforce the policy. Did you get what I just said? The convention says, don't enforce the policy. And they say, we're going to do it. Well, we're going to see what happens. Because the current president needs that lobby of homosexuals to get, to get elected. And then the church to which some of my colleagues would, colleagues would like to belong to here, you know what's happening in the, in the uh, Anglican community, the Episcopal Church. You have a threat of division. Now, very nicely, the American Episcopal Church has said, that they're not going to ordain any more homosexual bishops. That's not satisfying the Africans. The Africans have said, this is not good. You see, there are more African, there are more African Anglicans than there are American Episcopalians. And I don't know what the statistics are, but I bet there are more African Lutherans than there are American Lutherans in America. When I said before, that we in ourselves, we are not responsible for the work which we're doing. Nobody that I know went over to Africa and said, would you like to be nice to the Missouri Synod? They came over and they are asking for our help. I'm not involved in that work. I was invited to a reception, so I was involved in that work. Just too, too old and too tired to do all that stuff. And our men are going, they want to be Lutherans. And if one thing is going to save the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, all churches, as they get older, there's a shift. There's a shift in what they believe, and you can't correct it. Oh, you can attempt to correct it, like things in society. 
Whoever thought they'd be giving out birth controls pills in, to middle school in Portland, Maine? Was that even within the realm of possibility 50 years ago? It wasn't even dawned on anybody to do that. Didn't mean it going on, but it was covered up. Whoever thought of that? These are big movements in society, and it doesn't seem very, it doesn't seem very hopeful that these things can be changed. But one of the very hopeful things, so far as the ministry is, so far as the Lutheranism is concerned, is these now, Mr. Finch mentioned um, this guy, he's Anglo-Saxon, white. His wife is African, I believe. Uh, they're in Kenya, is that right? Walter Obari, Walter Obari, the Bishop of Kenya, you cannot get ordained in Sweden as a clergy person in the Church of Sweden unless you take communion, mass, from a woman priest three times and that it be legally authenticated that you did it. And you must get ordained with a woman priest. Because see, a lot of the people in that situation says, okay, this is the way the church is, but I'm not going to go to communion with those gals and so forth. They're making them do it. Walter Obari, who is a Kenyan bishop, established by the Swedish Lutheran Church, he went in there about a year or two ago, and he ordained their own bishops. Now that is a great guy. That is one heck of a great guy. That's an Inchon landing for those of you who are old enough about the Korean War. And then he was chastised by the Lutheran World Federation Council of which he was a member. And he wrote him, that, that's the speech that he gave, a beauty, he's so eloquent, so eloquent, absolutely eloquent. We published that in, the, in, our, in our seminary journal. His son, and I just met him two days ago, is at our seminary. We do have, uh, I can't get my words anymore. I'll say we have the manpower. I can't find out what I want to say. We have the, not the ammunition, but we have the means to provide a theological education that you cannot find in Siberia, Estonia, Lithuania, Madagascar, Malaysia. We have the means. We have the men who can, can do it. So the philosophy is first to bring the men over here and train them and then to go back. You have to have seminaries. This is always a question in which the Missouri Synod doesn't get it right. Which comes first, the ministry or the church? It's not the church, it's the ministry. Within God's eyes, it's the church because the church is the body of Christ. And if you agree with St. Paul, that all believers have already been buried with Christ and have been raised with Christ and sit with him in the heavenly places. That's the prior reality. But within the terms of this world, the ministry comes first. We don't send over lay people. You got to send over the big Jesus. When the Holy Father wanted to convert Ireland, who did he send over? No, St. Patrick didn't go over. He went over by himself, somebody else. He, he was not a Roman Catholic. But that's the way you do it. And that's the way we're doing it. And we're not doing it because we sat down and discussed it. This would be a nice way to do it. It just happened that way. It happened that way. We didn't plan it that way. And the minister makes a big, big commitment. The rest of us can work pretty much where we want to. The minister has to work where the church, he can show up where he wants to. Dr. Feuerhahn indicated these lay preachers, what he called the Schwerma, who appeared all over. They just appeared up in the Reformation and said, I'm a preacher. A lot of people who are going into the ministry are not well prepared. I'll tell you, there's another Bible passage that goes like this. It'll all come out in the wash. <laughs> they will. You'll soon find out this guy doesn't know too much. You'll find that out pretty, pretty soon. Well, <coughs> And I'll get into this because some of you, one thing I can, I'm working on this, I'm working on this essay on Francis Pieper. 
And there's a lot of this, uh, some of the stuff which I have written are on the back table. Now, I'm sorry I didn't bring this book. I have one copy of the book, and my wife, I just spoke to her on the phone, apparently Zondervan, this was really a fun book. I was asked by Zondervan publishers to write an essay on the um, Lutheran doctrine of the Lord's Supper, and that there, there would be three other writers, a Roman Catholic priest, a Swinglian, that's a radical reform, and a Calvinist. And we would each get to respond to the other. But we couldn't see each other's responses until it was published. So they would have my essay, which is number three, I think. And then they have a Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a Roman Catholic. I say it's a fun thing. Because when you have theological discussion, it's much better if everybody puts his or her cards right on the, on the table. Well, I really got it from the, I got it, I got it from all of them, and I kind of enjoyed it. The, um, the Calvinists said, that's the trouble with these Lutherans. They don't understand that we really believe that Christ is present in the Lord's Supper. Then he put in Latin, very and very tot, or something like that. And he says, but the only, the only issue, issue is we don't believe he's present in the elements. <laughs> now, isn't that much better to have him saying it than having me say it? Not that I set up the guy. I wouldn't do that. Huh? I'm too principled for that. <laughs> but uh, in one of these other things which I'm doing on Francis Pieper, and I've already written two essays on him, and one of the essays is in the book back there, is that when you work with a topic, you never, you never claim to be an authority on any particular topic, because as I said before, don't go back and, I can't preach an old sermon, simply because my mind has changed, situations have changed, and so forth. So this is the third time I'm writing on paper. I thought I would maybe spit this out in about a week during the summer. Well, I was still going at it in June. And then I was visiting with Mr. Ollendorf, who's not the most, well, I won't say he's not the most reputable person. But in our discussion, he brings up other things. I said, oh, he smokes, I gotta go back and put in more. But one of the things that stri struck me about the ministry in the uh, Francis Pieper, who is the great theologian of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, is that he had a brother by the name of, there were three brothers. Reinhold was the president at Springfield. Francis, which is, a, which is the big name, was the president of the Missouri Synod in St. Louis. And the other guy was August. And by the way, I succeeded Pieper's son, so I have, I have a pretty close uh, a connection socially with members of the family, and I still do, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, is that his brother was teaching a doctrine of the ministry which was totally opposed to the Lutheran confessions, and Pieper didn't do anything about it. August Pieper formulated what is known as the Wisconsin Doctrine of the Ministry. Their doctrine of the ministry is that every person is a minister. Now, Dr. Feuerhahn referred to a book by who? Oscar Foyt. Oscar Foyt. I went to school with his son. Everybody a minister. Ron Feuerhahn said that book was a disaster. It was a disaster. It wasn't anything new. The Wisconsin Synod was teaching that all back in 1880. And so, if you form, I cannot, I can't understand why Missouri Synod people who are discontent with our congregations go to the Wisconsin Synod. Because they're actually saying there is no ministry. That's what they're saying. All they say we have a ministry, but it has been, the church establishes out of, out of love. Well, we have a sexton which we establish out of love. We have church organists established out of love. There are a lot of people who get paychecks from the church that do not have divine that do not have divine offices. These are not. What do we mean by divine? Not simply that it's in the Bible, but something which is commanded. And there's where we begin. The ministry is commanded, and that ministry is that the fellow who preaches the gospel and administers the sacraments.
the man who was responsible for your souls, the guy who was responsible to get your son back into the church. That's what the ministry is. That's the burden which it bears. The Wisconsin Senate didn't believe that. And, and uh, I did bring this essay along. It doesn't really matter. And we might as well look at it since this, since you people are so big on the Lutheran confessions. Let's see what it says. To obtain such faith, God instituted the office of the ministry. We won't see anything more. Well, even the late Robert Price, may his soul rest in peace. He held that this referred to the ministry of all Christians. When he lost his job, he changed his opinion about that. And so when, the, when it comes to establishing the office of the ministry, those who are confessionally bound say, oh, it's established in Article 14. That's the big argument in the Missouri Synod. Order in the church is what the title is. I don't have the German Bekenntnisschrift in with me. It is talking among us that nobody should publicly teach or preach or minister without a regular call. <coughs> well, you heard it from Dr. Fire on this morning. There are three steps in the ministry. I think he said preparation, ordination, and call. So what has happened in Missouri Synod thinking is you can get rid of the first two, and all you have to do is have a congregation call somebody, and you got a minister. We're sitting around here. We have no pastor. Hey, you do it. In fact, look at all the money we would save. No pension. No pension payments. That's the Wisconsin Synod. Now, you realize when the Missouri Synod emphasizes Article 14, which I think is wrong, because the article of the ministry is established in Article 5, what you do is you turn the ministry into law. Why do we have the ministry? God said so. If he said so, that's it. No friend at all. The ministry is the extension of the person of Jesus Christ. And is in that office, the gospel is proclaimed. The ministry belongs to the gospel and not to the law. How many of you are Calvinists? Just raise your hand, Reformed. How many of you Reformed? The Reformed believe that the ministry is established so that we can lead better sanctified lives. Nothing, my mother would be a good Calvinist. May her soul rest in peace. She liked order. You're proud that you're a German, you like order. But the ministry doesn't follow in the concept of order. Now the way this lecture was advertised was Article 28 of the Augsburg Confession and assumably the Apology. And why was that essay chosen? Because Pastor Neuendorf, uh, not, uh, Ollendorf, is that his name? Was pushing me to the wall about what I was gonna speak about. The article that is missed in studying the office of the ministry happens to be Article 28 of the Augsburg Confession and of the Apology. And that article says that it does not belong to the office of the minister to engage in earthly rule. It is not his job to make decisions in political matters. And also, for example, in regard to church property and those things, that doesn't belong, that does not belong to his, that does not belong to his, to his office. And it is in this that it says, what is the office of the keys? That's what it says in our, it's nothing else but the preaching of the gospel. The office of the keys is not what the voters assembly does in removing a person from the church. That's not the office of the keys. The office of the keys is what the minister does every moment of his life. That's what he does whether he's visiting a sick person, whether he's trying to get someone to have his or her child baptized, that is what the office is. In that office, the gospel is preached. And the one article, the one confession, which never enters into the discussion, and yet we accept this. This is the book which we accept, even though I'd rather argue it on the basis of the Bible. The problem when you go to the confessions is you think, then you ignore what Jesus did. But the one confession that does not enter into this discussion very frequently is the treatise on the power and the primacy of the Pope. And that, argue, that, article, that document is an explanation of the Augsburg Confession. And the argument goes like this. 
Can we have the Pope? Yes. We can have the Pope, but he's no higher than any other bishop. Can we have the Pope? Yes. Can we give him primacy over other bishops? Yes. But it's only a, part, it's only a place of honor, not that his word counts for anything else. The second part of the treatise on the primacy on the Pope is the treatise on the jurisdiction of bishops. And what's the argument? Can we have bishops? The Lutherans, at least up till 1935, 1535 or 1536, said we are going to have bishops. That's the ordinary way in which the church organizes itself, bishops. But it goes on to say that within the ministry, the authority of the bishop is no different than the authority of any other pastor. So that you have it, all pastors share in the ministry equally. Dr. Feuerhahn approached that subject this morning when he said ordination is never to a single congregation. It isn't. Ordination is not a congregational act. It takes place, obviously, in a congregation. It doesn't take place in McDonald's. That happens within a congregation. But that man is being recognized as having, to use Feuerhahn's term, the habitus to be a pastor any place. Everybody in this room who is a clergy person is already recognized to be competent as a minister or a pastor in any other place. And if a pastor should be visiting in a church where a late person is, a, is conducting the service, the late person should step aside and ask that other person to do it. Except tomorrow, I'd have preferred if Mr. Ollendorf had had somebody else besides me. <laughs> Fully realizing how generous Mr. Ollendorf is. The strange thing about Francis Pieper, boy, uh, when, uh, I've, I, I, uh, when you, you shouldn't know anybody too well <laughs> because you begin to see the flaws. But I was aware of this flaw before, that he could not take the Wisconsin Senate view of the ministry to task because his brother was the president of the seminary. How's that time going? Do we have time for, is it questions or what is it? Yeah, what, are the, what, what is the time? I have, I'm, it's two o'clock. Yeah, yeah. a few, oh well, yeah, the panelists. I didn't do the subject, but what the heck, that's no different than my classes. Well, uh, Dr. Skier, thank you. And it's like being back in class. He talks about everything. <laughs> uh, Dr. Feuerhan hoped he didn't offend everyone. I know you hope you did. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, it seems to me our synod is uh, in a very dangerous state. We have a special offering going right now to, to fund the seminaries. A special offering. We don't do it ordinarily anymore. And neither do we seem to be paying or supporting missionaries. They have to raise their own money. It doesn't sound like the Synod is actually pro-ministry anymore, is it? Well, yeah, the, I know this is not being taped, but I think your question is too narrow. You know, that's the old thing, and if a person can't answer a question, you're not asking the right question. Well, why don't you write a book with all the right questions in so I know what to ask? But what the question is, is that the synod becomes less and less significant in the life of the congregations. And this is, as, um, it's not so necessarily the fault of the synod. It's the, it's the, the congregations now look upon themselves as self-contained autonomous units. So that you can have congregations in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, spending $4 million for a school, $1 million for an elevator, you can go all over the Missouri Center. There are churches that are engaged in extensive building programs with millions of bucks. And yet, Mr. Finch has to come out here and ask for contributions. We have the Lutheran Heritage Foundation having to ask to do it. And I don't, I think it's a two-sided situation. <coughs> the money is there and the people are just as generous as they've always been. But they're giving the money directly. And I cannot change that particular situation. Our schools, our colleges, which is an extensive, they're independent. But people think within 
They think of the, they think of the church only within their congregation. And I, I'm not as successful as Mr. Wente is in bringing support. But when I bring, I spend the summers out, out in the east so I can maintain a certain level of sophistication for the rest of the year. <laughs> and I try to get bucks to, to get my sisters who are fairly well off. They don't get it. That want the, uh, the larger congregations, they take their pastors from other congregations. The smaller congregations, they take, that's what Carl Vicentri does, he, they take their people from the seminary and they get the younger guys who are a little wet behind the, the ears. They never get the message that it comes from someplace. And I bring up the point, if you're studying for law, if you're studying for medicine, if you're studying to be a certified public accountant, you're going to be making the bucks. And you're going to be supporting the school you graduated from. Our ministers are not making that kind of money. Notre Dame gets endowments of 40 million bucks a shot. And yet if you give a thousand bucks to the seminary, you're thinking you're giving your life. Come on, gang, get with it. That's the answer, Mr. Olson, right there. The congregations do not. There was a time when the synod was big, at least that's when I was a kid. My father was a pastor in Brooklyn. The synod was a big thing, even though we were very few Lutherans out there in Brooklyn. The synod was a big thing, it isn't anymore. It's not the fault of the synod, it's, it's, a kind of, it's, it's on both sides. Uh, Dr. Scary, you spoke of... I thought the, you were going to ask whether I was going to be retired. I don't know. Well, I, I was. Uh, I was anticipating that like our Lord's second coming. I see. Joyful anticipation. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you spoke of the, the ministry as a burden and also, as Dr. Feuerheim mentioned, a, a habitus. Uh, in your opinion, uh, are synods recent uh, decision to begin the specific ministry pastor program uh, will will such men in your opinion have the uh, necessary habitus or the uh, ability to bear that burden well dr Feuerhan alluded to that particular thing and that is how this is going to uh, uh, pan out i do not know but it is frequently said that a seminary is not, God did not establish a seminary. What's the name of this church? No one ever said that God also did not establish Mount Olive Church. There's no, so let's, let's bury that silly argument right then and there. But the training of the ministry is a divine thing, not because the confessions say so, but what is our gospels? Our gospels are the teaching that Jesus gave to his apostles to his disciples in order for them to be apostles. Seminaries are divinely necessary because there's a, a seminary is a love-hate situation. People think it's going to be some Bible camp like you when you came there. Hey, but, Thank you for writing me of that. Uh, yeah. And uh, it isn't because I hate to say, oh, the learning goes on in the library and off the campus and oh, bury it, say something worthwhile. But the learning goes on when students are questioning their instructors away from the instructor's ears, when the students are getting into controversies with other students. There's where the learning takes place. So there is a sharpening up. You remove that part of aspect and you will produce a different kind of a person. That's all I can say. Thank you. Well, I've never been in your class and, and witnessed some of what is going on. What did you say, thank God? <laughs> I, all right, I will. <laughs> but this thought came to my mind, and, and I think it came to mind before I got here. You know, when I saw your, what the title of your portion of this lecture was, which, by the way, you finally got to in the last five minutes. <laughs> Would you love to have him as a member of your church? Pardon? 
going on. But in getting ready to come today, I look back in two years ago, uh, we, we had a similar to such as this, and Dr. Farhan, from my notes of what he said, was this. One thing he, and I don't know whether he was quoting, this was from himself, or whether he was quoting someone else, I don't know, but he said, if you cannot curse, you cannot bless. And then also in my notes, I have this, uh, tell the truth, but tell it in love. My question is, do you believe that what Dr. Farhan two years ago said, if I had it right, would you agree that both seminaries in Missouri Senate are still necessary so that we can maintain checks and balances within our Senate? After all, it is a human organization, you know, the Senate itself. But I just we have many disagreements among ourselves. But the problem is, is they've not been resolved now for many, many, many years. Probably the whole of, of the truth of the 1900s. Right. Because this goes, I remember the, uh, yeah. when I was a kid, they came out with this brief statement. Yeah. Anyway, and once I read recently that uh, Franz Pieper had said, we are not orthodox anymore because we do not challenge and straighten out come to God pleasing solutions. Would you, do you think that both of you agree in the fact that yes, we need to maintain both seminaries, just like in, you just mentioned in either seminary, when the students themselves get to tackling a situation or we in our congregation are going to have disagreements, we need to get it resolved then and there. You won't get it resolved then and there. The, I just want to make a point, and that is the Senate is, not, is no more a human organization this crowd and congregation. And that if two congregations hold to the same positions, believe the same things, it's not a question of, of them having a vote, whether they're going to be in fellowship or communion with one another to form a Senate. They will have to. And if you don't form a fellowship with a church, then that is a sin. I do not like calling the Senate a covenant of love. It's not a covenant of love. Because if it's a covenant of love, I wouldn't have been in it considering who's members. But it is a necessity. It is absolutely a necessity, and that's why I'm very happy to hear about all of these Lutheran churches in Kenya, Sudan, what, who knows what's going to happen in Madagascar? But now, be, 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 what's that? It must be koinia. There must be. Well, the question is, it, some things will not be solved over any number of years. And I already brought that up quite clearly with Francis Pieper. He was responsible for not coming to an agreement with the Wisconsin Senate on the doctrine of the ministry. And does that have political repercussions? It certainly does, because the Evangelical Lutheran Senate held to the Missouri Senate doctrine. They, they are supported, they get their bucks for their college from the Wisconsin Senate and their doctrine of the ministry has shifted over. There's absolutely no guarantee when a group of people get together on a local level or at a synodical convention or a district convention that just because they are together within a certain time frame, they're gonna settle their, difficult, their, their differences. It doesn't happen that way. It didn't happen that way with Luther. And when after Luther died, all hell broke loose and things had to be resolved in the formula of Concord of 1578. And then all hell grows, club looks again. I think it's, we, we fooled ourselves, we will fool ourselves into thinking that we will reach a, a pleasant plateau where the church will have no problems and all the people will believe the same thing and everything will be peace. It will not happen, otherwise Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against it, which means the gates of hell are just gonna keep coming and coming and coming. Do we need two seminaries? <coughs> the answer is yes, for the very reasons that you said. And I've God forbid that I should disagree with Dr. Feuerhahn. <laughs>